spending across the board. Democratic Alliance is today hanging the whole corrupt system, which is designed to steal taxpayers' money. Two city council employees observe the happening disapprovingly. Press Secretary Maxim Rovinsky has prepared a symbolic gesture of his own. I would like to present to you two laws, the law on local self-government, which defines our area of authority, and the law on public procurement, which the city council observes when tendering. Here you are, secondly, today is an important holiday, Ascension Day. The performance that you arranged, of course, drew attention to you. Here is some holy water. I advise you to absolve yourselves, because what you have done today does not really fit with orthodox tradition. Did you give this to the councillors too? Excuse me? The members of the city council. No, today the councillors were all in church. Aside from his religious objections to Democratic Alliance's action, Maxim says the figures they cited were distorted. But he admits that corruption is a problem in Ukraine. It's not that it's normal, but it's a part of culture. It's a part of culture, unfortunately, in this country too. It's something that was here before we were. It wasn't us who invented it. The action sparked discussion in front of the town hall. The man in the pink shirt is an official who asked not to be identified. In Great Britain, it took 200 years to develop the system of democratic values in which the country lives and develops. But the basis of this system is the rule of law. Those are Margaret Thatcher's words. Here, unfortunately, we don't have the rule of law. That's why we have this illness that we have. And that's why it's okay for you to charge kindergartens one euro twenty for sugar that costs sixty cents, is it? Tell me, is that Thatcher's fault? Is that democracy's fault? Or because one individual officer decided to steal? Tatiana, a local journalist, actually found this discussion unusually positive. The usual reaction is to ignore any allegations, or sometimes they take a piece of paper and write a formal rebuttal, noting that they're offended. Back on the train, we get a chance to ask the man in charge of Ukraine's Euro 2012 preparations, Deputy Prime Minister Boris Kolesnikov, for his reaction to allegations that he and other officials have been taking huge kickbacks from tournament spending. What matters are the facts. Facts, I need facts. If there's corruption, we'll prepare the proof and give it to the police and let the police take it to the courts. There are no facts, so we can only gossip. And do you personally think that any facts will emerge? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for facts. I can't say I'll be happy if such facts do come to light, but I'm waiting. So far, no facts have emerged. The train pulls into Lviv to a football-themed fanfare. Staged welcomings notwithstanding, Boris Kolesnikov and his Russian-speaking colleagues are not popular figures in Lviv. Famed for its vibrant old town and cafe culture, this Ukrainian-speaking city is traditionally the most pro-European part of the country. In fact, though, disappointed after two years under a Russia-friendly government, people from all over Ukraine are pinning their hopes on Europe and on Euro 2012. Our infrastructure is poor. I think that Ukraine is absolutely not ready for Euro 2012. Of course, we hope that everything will be OK. It won't. But for Ukraine, it is a significant step, because we're trying to get into the European structures, to build strong relationships with Europe. So we've got high hopes from you foreigners coming here. So you see our country and visit us, and see what beautiful cities we have, like Lviv. Real hope or just wishful thinking? Optimism is rare in today's Ukraine. 
Euro 2012 has raised expectations, but this is a country that has had more than its share of broken promises. All right, there you saw it. Gulliver Craig's road trip uh, for reporters, the France 24 investigative news magazine. After watching it, uh, George Frederick Jewsbury, would you say that Ukraine's a fit venue for uh, Euro 2012? Well, it's too late to say whether it is or not. It is. It is as it is, as Clint Eastwood always said. Uh, I was interested in the uh, official statement that there's proof we'll go to court. Only 1% of the people who appear before Ukrainian courts are declared innocent. 1%. So you have a system that is, the report showed, is totally corrupt. Uh, it is an extractionist system, and it's an exclusivist system. The average uh, GDP per capita in Ukraine is around $7,000. The average death age for a man in Ukraine is 63.7 years. You have huge infrastructure problems. And then a court system, Timoshenko, maybe she should be in jail or not, but she was put in jail for political reasons. So, no, there's a lot, a lot of reason to be optimistic um, for the people there at the moment. Uh, in the report on Tom Kozlov, there was that one local official who says um, uh, it's not that corruption is right, it's just that it's part of our culture. Well... <clears throat> There is certain truth to that because corruption is certainly part of the late Soviet culture and it was not invented either in Ukraine or in Russia yesterday or even 20 years ago. It's been there for at least, I would say, uh, 50 years, at least, if not longer. I mean, uh, but uh, uh, the problem uh, uh, which uh, what, what we see in Ukraine and in Russia as well is that it is a semi-criminal state. It's not just a question of corruption. I mean, corruption we certainly encounter in Europe, certainly not to the same extent, but we do. But the problem is that uh, state institutions are dysfunctional. The country is run by different mafia clans. And all those political infighting, it's not about real politics as it will be uh, in Europe. It's, it's all about uh, divisions of spheres of influence, divisions of uh, financial resources. We're dealing with criminal clans. Uh, Timoshenko represented certain clans. Now, uh, Yanukovych represents other clans. So that's, that's the meaning of this infighting. I think uh, certainly a lot of Ukrainians supported the Orange Revolution. Certainly uh, Timoshenko and uh, Yushchenko were welcomed. But I, let's not uh, uh, overestimate their democratic value. And uh, the, the, let's just remind viewers here that that happened back in 2004, right. the Orange Revolution. People didn't understand how a pro-Russian party then won the next election afterwards. Well, I think it's very simple. I mean, Ukraine is uh, basically divided into two parts, Eastern Ukraine and Western Ukraine. Western Ukraine is pro-Western because it used to be a part of Poland, was annexed by the Soviet Union in 1939. Uh, uh, some parts were uh, uh, even before part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, like the city of Lviv. Uh, now, Eastern Ukraine is uh, 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 Russia. Uh, so... We certainly, you know, the, the, those uh, Russian-speaking uh, uh, regions, they support Russia. Ukrainian-speaking, they favor integration with the EU. The problem is that apart from this division, and certainly uh, uh, people in uh, western parts of Ukraine are more western-like, unlike the eastern parts. But, I mean, <clears throat> you have to understand that. Ukraine today, it is not a uh, European or, say, part European, part Asian state. It is a, a very peculiar uh, 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 state, uh, uh, which has nothing to do with uh, even Poland or Bulgaria. And when we come back, uh, we'll be taking, a, a, we'll be throwing the spotlight on uh, what makes Ukraine tick with Gulliver Craig, who. Uh, was uh, the one who shot that report for us. Stay with us. You're watching the France Vanquette debate.